When I was in the uh, second or third grade, I came down with a pretty bad case of strep throat, and so my mom did what, what any good mom would do. She scheduled an appointment for me with the doctor and then warned me in the process, you're probably going to get a shot. Now, I was okay with being sick and missing school. I was okay with going to the doctor, but as soon as I heard the word shot, like I was overwhelmed with fear because I had this, this um, weird terror about getting a shot in my butt. And so I started crying. Like, mom, mom, but what if the doctor gives me a shot in my butt? In my bottom, we couldn't say butt in our house, so I'd use the word bottom. And so my mom very lovingly, very clearly, but very calmly said, Jeffrey, that's what she uses when she's being tender or angry, Jeffrey, they don't give shots in the bottom for this. That's called foreshadowing, by the way. So we go to the doctor. They indeed confirm I need a shot, but I was good. Like, you know, the nurse starts preparing the supplies for the shot, but I'm preparing my arm for the shot because my mom assured me it would not be in the other place that I was afraid of. And, and so the nurse turns around with the biggest needle I've ever seen in my life and says, all right, Mr. Manish, you're going to have to drop your drawers. This one's going in your backside. My eyes got as big as saucers. I looked at my mom with a look of horror and disgust and abandonment. A look of how could you do this to me? You know, I thought my mom, she is going to rise up. She is going to step in between this nurse and I. She's going to say, I am sorry. You will not do that to my son because I assured him. So I look at my mom for help. You know what my mom did? She did this. (laughs) Just shrugged. Let me get the shot. So then when, you know, I became a parent, I decided I'm going to spare my children from this, you know, in life. So, you know, whenever they went to the doctor, I would just tell them, you're probably getting a shot in your butt, just get prepared, right? (laughs) Some of you are thinking what you often think with me, like, where are you going with this? (laughs) Well, as I was preparing for and praying through today's subject, I kept coming back to that story from my childhood, and I promise I'll tie it in here in a second. We're in week three of a sermon series called 23, as we are walking through Psalm 23 together in Scripture. So far in the series, we've looked at how Jesus is our good and our guiding shepherd. He is perfect, providing for us rest and relationship and righteousness, guiding us onto the right path. And today, I want us to see Jesus as our guarding shepherd. And some of you might hear me say the word guarding, and you immediately think, but Jesus didn't guard me. He didn't guard the person I love. I I asked Jesus to guard me, to protect me, and he didn't. So I'm not sure I can trust Jesus as a guarding shepherd. And for a lot of people, that right there is the, the main reason they don't believe in Jesus, or at least they don't trust him. And I get it. I do. I understand there are people in this very room who are going through or have gone through the worst possible pain and problems this life has to offer. You asked God to protect you, and he didn't. And if that's you, by the way, if you're here and you don't believe in Jesus, maybe you're angry at him or you've walked away from him or you're struggling to trust him for any reason, please know Jesus is not angry with you. He loves you. He desperately wants to be in relationship with you and his love for you and our love for you as a church is unchanging. We love it that you are here and we love you and I hope you, you know that. I do believe, though, for a lot of us, even for those of us who believe in and follow Jesus, we, we often view his protecting, we view his guarding the wrong way. We view Jesus like my mom in my story, who didn't step in and keep me from experiencing pain. But here's the thing with my mom in that story. Here's the thing with Jesus that I think we all need to understand. And listen, this is something I struggle with in my own life. That whenever I experience any pain or any brokenness from this world, whenever I see the extent 
of the brokenness and pain that we experience in life. I struggle with this myself, and I need reminded of this, that my mom was much more concerned with protecting what was inside of me than protecting what happened to me in the moment. And that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't care about our moments, because he does. But Jesus, as our good, our guiding, and our guarding shepherd, he doesn't always guard me from all pain and problems. He, he guards me from their power over me. That's our big idea for today, by the way. Jesus doesn't guard me from all pain and problems. He guards me from their power over me. Jesus is more concerned on what's happening on the inside of me spiritually than he is just moment by moment the pain I might experience. I mean, the reality is if I expect Jesus to protect me from all pain and problems, I will be continually disappointed in Jesus. Sadly, because sin entered the world, everything is broken, so pain and problems are just a part of our existence in life. And sometimes Jesus does protect us from those things, but not always. And I don't understand all of that. Like, like, like that's part of the mystery of the sovereignty of God, that, that God in his sovereignty and control will sometimes step in and it seems like he saves the day, and then other times it feels like he's a million miles away, right? So I don't understand how that all works. All I know is this, Jesus doesn't guard me from all pain and problems. He guards me of their power over me. So here's the big question we've got to try and help answer today. What does Jesus do to guard me? What does Jesus do to guard me? Our main scripture is one verse, Psalm 23, verse four, found in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. We will look at a couple other verses and some quotes that'll all be on the screens for you. You can follow along. It's all there in the Harbor app as well. You can follow the message notes there. We're jumping right into the first part of Psalm 23, verse four. It says this, even when, that's a big word, by the way, because it's not even if. It's even when, it's coming. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, you might be familiar with, I will not be afraid. Uh, one commentary I read said the phrase not be afraid means I will not give way to my fears. That even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't give way to my fears. I won't be overcome by them. So it doesn't mean there's nothing to be afraid of in the valley. It just means we don't have to be controlled by the fear of the valley. It's something on the inside of us. Sounds a lot like the song we sang earlier at the very start of the service. I raise a hallelujah, fear you've lost your hold on me. Now that's our big idea right there. That Jesus doesn't guard me from all pain and problems. He guards me from their power over me. He guards me from the hold that fear can have in my life. So what does Jesus do to guard me? Well, the next part of the verse tells us, look at the entire first part of the verse. We'll read what we already read again. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for, or that literally means because, the reason is you are close beside me. Jesus, my good shepherd, is with me. So the first thing Jesus does to guard us is this. He gives me his presence. He gives me his presence. We sang that earlier as well in a couple of songs, including the song Shepherd of My Heart, which is a song that we introduced for this series. I love that song. You know, I hope you understand that Chris and his team don't just you know, randomly throw songs in for us to sing. They work really hard at trying to line up songs that help prepare the way for the message. And today's worship was amazing, by the way, and really set the stage for this, this message today. And we sang in that song, over mountains, through the valleys, your presence will surround me. You hold me through it all. Or as it says in Psalm 23, verse four, I will not be afraid for you are with me, you're close beside me. God is with us, amen? 
That's not just a message for Christmas, by the way. <laughs> like the name Emmanuel for Jesus does not just apply in December. It applies in January too. Emmanuel he is, God is with us. In one of the darkest valleys I've had to walk through in my ministry life, God reminded me of that truth through a conversation with my own dad. I was a youth pastor at the time at a church that my wife and I loved being at. Um, we, we had served there for a number of, of years. We loved the people. We absolutely loved the students. We loved the pastor that we served with. We loved being in ministry in general. We were having a great time. Had no plans on anything changing. And then out of nowhere, everything changed one day. Our pastor, without warning, was wrongfully removed in my eyes by a few people in leadership over a difference of what appeared to be a difference of opinion and methodology. There was no moral, no ethical failure that happened. He had the uh, overwhelming support of the majority of the congregation and membership, but a few people in leadership took control and removed him. Horrible things were said and done in the name of Jesus. It still breaks my heart to remember how poorly God's church and how poorly God's people acted in that season. And because of that, we didn't know if we wanted to be in ministry anymore. I knew I could no longer be a youth pastor at this church and reconcile that in my own conscience to, uh, um, when you compare it with the, the way the leaders had, had, had led. So I prepared my resignation to present to these leaders who had removed our pastor. The church was being ripped to shreds. It was awful. Sabrina and I had three babies at home at the time. We had no other job lined up. I didn't know if I wanted to be in ministry anymore. Honestly, I didn't know if I wanted to be in the church anymore. I was hurt, I was confused, and I wondered where in the world is God in all of this? So I called my dad. My dad knew what was going on and I wanted to share my resignation with him to get his input on what I said and how I said it. And I don't honestly remember anything in our conversation outside of one thing he said at the very end of our talk, right before I was gonna go off and present my resignation to the people who had removed our pastor, my dad just said this, Jeff, I am right there with you when you do this. I'm right there with you when you do this. And man, knowing that my dad who was hundreds of miles away, was with me, I can't tell you how much confidence that gave me in the valley. And friends, I believe that's what Jesus says to us when we are in the darkest valley. He says, son, he says, daughter, I am right there with you as you walk through this. I'm with you. Albert Barnes' commentary said this, the true friend of God has nothing to fear in that dark valley. His great shepherd will accompany him there and can lead him safely through, however dark it may appear. In that dark and gloomy valley, though I could not guide myself, I will not be alarmed. I will not be afraid of wandering or being lost. I will not fear any enemies there, for my shepherd is there to guide me still. I don't know what any of you are going through or will go through. I don't know what dark valleys are represented in this room. All I know is this. For those who trust in the good shepherd, for those who follow the lead of our guiding shepherd, we will be protected by our guarding shepherd. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you've lost your hold on me. Why? because he gives me his presence. So here's a question I think all of us should ask Jesus. Where in my life are you wanting to reveal your presence? Where in my life are you wanting to reveal your presence? Perhaps it's the very place that you thought he was absent, he wants to reveal to you he's there, he's there. Jesus doesn't guard me from all pain and problems. He guards me from their power over me. So what does Jesus do to guard me? Well, he gives me his presence. He says, I'm with you as you walk through this valley.
Second thing Jesus does is this. He gives me his protection. He gives me his protection, which might sound contradictory because I just said he doesn't always protect. But I think this protection we're going to look at is a little bit different than what we might think. The last part of Psalm 23, verse 4, says this, your rod, speaking about the shepherd, our good shepherd, your rod and staff protect and comfort me. A shepherd typically, not always, but typically had two instruments he would use. He would use a rod and a staff. The type A people who saw those up there are like, finally he's using those. I wondered if he was ever going to touch those things. One of these days, I'm going to put an illustration on stage and never mention it just to drive type A people crazy because I are one, okay? I, a, a shepherd would often have a rod and a staff. A rod was a four to six foot piece of wood, kind of like this, probably thicker though, a little bit heavier. This one's really, really light, just a walking stick. And then they would have a staff with a crook on the end of it. If they did not have the, the rod, they would just use the opposite end of the staff for the things we're going to look at here. So let, let's, let's just take the staff first. A shepherd would, would use a staff like this with a crook on the end of it for correction and for protection. That if a sheep was timid or fearful, a shepherd could, could grab the sheep and pull it close to his side for safety. Or, you know, if, a, if they need to get through a a narrow gate. There was only one way to get through something. The path was very narrow. The shepherd could take the, the staff and kind of use it to guide the sheep through the narrow gate or the narrow path. Uh, shepherds were known because they, they knew that sheep were most vulnerable when they were alone. So they would, they would use their staff to kind of gather the sheep into groups knowing there was safety in numbers. They would gather sheep in groups. Hello! Are you noticing the spiritual analogies here to what a shepherd might do with his staff? We also established last week that sheep are dumb. <laughs> Left to our own devices, we wander. As the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And so a shepherd, when he saw a sheep going off on its own or onto a way that was dangerous, would often take this and put it around its neck, which is not comfortable, or hook its legs and pull it back from harm. Or maybe a shepherd would put his head where it didn't belong and get stuck. Or would fall into a stream getting a drink of water and they could, they could hook the sheep and pull it back to safety or pull it out of the place where it put its head. Like the, the staff was a tool of discipline used for the protection of the sheep. Like we understand this principle in parenting that you discipline to protect. I know our kids don't understand it, but come on. Like we discipline normally. If you're a good parent, you discipline well to protect your children. And then one day, you know, they might get married, they might have their own kids, and they realize, oh, my parents weren't as dumb as I thought they were. <laughs> and we actually see this in Scripture, by the way. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, then verse 10 and 11 says this, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Verse 10, God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Wow. No discipline's enjoyable while it's happening, duh. Duh. It's painful, but afterward, there'll be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Last week, we, we talked about how Jesus guides us onto right paths, right living. That's what we're seeing here with discipline, but sometimes, because we are stubborn and we are wayward, he has to discipline us or correct us to get us back onto the right path. It's not comfortable when the hook goes around your neck but he's doing it to keep you safe. Safe from spiritual harm that you might be putting yourself into. And as someone who has often received the discipline and correction of God, it doesn't feel good when it happens, but it is good because it always leads me to share in his holiness, which is a concept we can't imagine, and it keeps me 
experiencing a harvest of right living, the peace of right living. So here's another question I think we should ask Jesus. Is there any part of my life you need to correct in order to protect me? Is there any part of my life you need to correct in order to protect me? Maybe it's a path I'm heading down that he doesn't want me to head down, or maybe it's an activity I've involved myself in that I should not be involved in, or maybe it's a group of people I've put myself around that are just not being great influence for me right now, and, and he's just trying to say, hey, I'm, I'm correcting you, and I know it doesn't feel good right now, but I'm telling you it's for your good. The good shepherd never beats his sheep, but he will discipline them and correct them so that they can share in his holiness. Jesus doesn't guard me from all pain and problems. He guards me from their power over me. And what does Jesus do to guard me? Well, he gives me his presence. He's with me. He gives me his protection. Number three, he gives me his peace. He gives me his peace. The last part of verse 24, we already read, didn't just say that his rod and staff protect us, but it says it comforts us as well. And because I needed three Ps, I said peace. It's a sickness, I'm telling you. You laugh, but it's like legitimately a sickness. But really, when he comforts us, it does give us peace, and so it works. <laughs> You'll notice I didn't even mention the, the rod yet when it comes to protection. Um, I did that for a reason. Because the protective part of the rod, I think, seems obvious. That a four to six foot piece of wood in a shepherd's hand and somebody cry, tries to attack the sheep, like, he, you can do some damage with this thing. You start swinging it around. So yes, the shepherd would often use the rod to, to beat away a predator or an enemy coming against the flock. If he didn't have both instruments, he would use the other side of the staff to, to, to protect the flock from the enemy. But there's something else that, that the shepherd would often do with the rod as well, I got curious and started just doing some research and kind of Google searches on ancient shepherding in the Middle East. And I learned two specific things that I'm gonna share with you. One I'm sharing next week, come back next week. One I'll share with you today. That the rod was not just used as a weapon, it was also used to help soothe the wounds of the sheep. And this blew me away. That as a shepherd in ancient Middle East would gather his sheep together, most likely at night, the sheep often would come through, would pass one by one in front of him. And then they would kind of gather in a, a flock for safety at night. And there might be you know, numerous shepherds doing this together for a flock, but the shepherd would take the staff and as the sheep passed by, because the wool of a sheep's very thick, if it's not been, you know, sheared, you can't see what's underneath. You can't see what's on the skin. You can't see if there's bruises or even brokenness. And so as the shepherd would pass by the sheep, the, the, or the sheep would pass by the shepherd, he would take his rod and he would just press down on the wool and it would part the wool and he could see what was underneath the wool as each sheep passed by. Or he would go to those on the ground as they're gathered together and he would just press down on the wool and they would part and he could, on the sides, on the top, and he would see if the sheep were tender from a bruise or brokenness. He could see if there was infection that needed treated, a wound that needed mended. If there was uncleanness, he would clean it. See, the, the, the rod what was not just to beat away the predator, it was also to bind up the broken, to mend the wounded, to, bu to put balm on scars. Sometimes the very brokenness, the very wounds, the very scars, the very infection, the very uncleanness that the sheep received because the shepherd led them through the valley. It's in the valley where we get broken. 
It's in the valley where we become unclean. It's in the valley where there are wounds and scars and infections and disease. And when the sheep takes his rod, he presses it. When the shepherd takes his rod, he presses it down on us to look below the surface, to say, is there anything unclean I need to clean? Is there any wound I need to mend? Is there any brokenness I need to restore? Is there any disease that needs treated? Any infection that needs the soothing balm of the Holy Spirit? It really is our vision here that as we partner with Jesus, our good shepherd, he restores those who are battered and broken, refuels those weary and worn, and then returns to, we return to our lives with Jesus, our shepherd at the center, changing the world one life at a time, that we can tell other people, hey, I know a shepherd that actually moon, win, mends wounds. I know someone who can deal with brokenness. I know someone who can restore the soul. And one by one, we as sheep, telling other sheep about a shepherd, whose rod and staff protect and comfort me, can lead one another to places of restoration. So here's the last question I think we should ask. Ask of Jesus, is there anything under the surface you want to comfort in me? Is there anything under the surface that you want to comfort in me? Any place you want to bring peace? Any brokenness that needs restored? Any wound that needs mended? Any scar that needs treated? Any infection that needs removed? Any uncleanness that needs clean? Is there anything under the surface that my wool covers but you see that your rod has revealed that you want to treat. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Try to find just a personal space with you and Jesus. I want to go back to those three questions. And just, we have time, so let's just take a little bit of time here with Jesus. Where in my life are you wanting to reveal your presence? Ask him. And Lord, I'd pray right now that there would be some people who came in today thinking you are a million miles away. And Lord, I pray they would sense your sweet presence right now in the midst of the dark valley. Is there any part of my life you need to correct in order to protect me? Lord, I pray for myself, for all of us, if there is, it's a, it's a dangerous question to ask you. Because if we ask you, you're gonna tell us, and it's on us to deal with that. So Lord, if there's any, any path someone's walking down that they shouldn't, if there's any activity someone's involved in that they need help with or need escape from, or if, there, if there's anything that you need to correct, Lord, in your loving, tender, compassionate way, would you do that? Would you just take your, your staff and kind of pull us back onto the right path so that we can share in your holiness? Is there anything under the surface, you might ask, that you want to comfort in my life, that you want to bring peace? And Lord, as you take your rod and you press down on our wool, would you please reveal those places that you want to mend and restore and bring healing? And then, Lord, if there's any help that needs pursued through a pastor, a counselor, a friend, a small group leader, Lord, would you just give us the courage to do that, to, to be honest about who we are under the surface? And maybe, maybe you're here today and you've You've not put your faith in Jesus. You've not trusted him as your good shepherd. And I, I wanna give you the chance to do that right now. And you can, you can put your faith in Jesus by just declaring it. Jesus, I believe. 
I believe you are God. You died in my place and you rose from the dead. You're alive. So I put my faith in you. Please forgive me of all my sins. Wash me clean, make me new. I repent and turn from my old sinful way of living with your help and the power of your spirit in my life. I will follow you in a new way. I receive from you salvation. Thank you for loving me. I'm gonna do my best to love you back. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you put your faith in Jesus, I say it every time, it's the best decision you'll ever make. It's the hardest one you will ever live out. We all need help living out our faith, me included, and we wanna help you. And one of the ways to receive help is by telling somebody that you put your faith in Jesus and we'd love to be somebody you tell. You can just text us the word LIFE to 63566. Text the word LIFE to 63566. And we are just gonna respond back with a uh, congratulations, a welcome, and then just some resources to get you taking your next steps with Jesus. Also, if you need prayer for anything happening in your life, as soon as I'm done here, uh, we'll have a group of folks right over here to my right, your left. They will stay as long as needed to pray for whatever need you have going on in your life. If you want prayer, stop up here before you go and we'll make sure and pray for you. Next week, we'll be concluding the series. And we're we'll doing communion as a part of our service next week. And so I'd encourage you to come back for that. We are doing a little bit things different with the order of service next week, so don't be late. Otherwise you might miss you know, some important parts of the service, so make sure you're here on time next week. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the reminder of the presence of our good shepherd. How you protect us, even when it doesn't feel good, through your discipline, you bring us back on the right path. And Lord, how you comfort us, how you give us peace, even in our brokenness and uncleanness and wounds and scars, there's comfort in the good shepherd. Help us experience that, Lord, even this week as we go. We love you and give you praise. It's in your name. Amen. I love you guys. Have an amazing week. We'll see you.